Hi, everybody. This is Trey Eidecker back with you again from UC San Diego. I'll be one of your two co-moderators for this official session one on algorithm development and machine learning approaches in genomics. And my co-chair. Hi, how are you doing? This is Anthony Filipakis from the Broad Institute. Uh, call, you know, dialing in here from my attic in Harvard Square. Uh, this is a very exciting session coming up. We have a great lineup of speakers, uh, and Trey and I are very excited to be able to be here for it. Great. Thanks a lot, Anthony. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce the first speaker. Uh, first speaker today is Dr. Jen Pung. He hails from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He is an associate professor of computer science, and the title of his talk is Machine Learning Algorithms for Structural and Functional Genomics. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jim Peng. I'm currently an associate professor of computer science and medicine at the University of Illinois. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. And uh, I would like to share off some of our research on structural biology and, and functional genomics, mainly from a machine learning perspective. So as we all know, a protein is composed of a sequence of amino acids. When, and the, when the protein is presented in the, in, the, in the solution, in the living cell, it has to be folded into a particular structure we call this native structure. And the problem of getting to know how the, after the protein is generated, how to get folded into the right structure, the problem is called a protein folding. And we have been studying this protein folding problem for decades. And, and why this protein folding problem is important? Why do we need to understand the structure? We all know that a structure provides a lot of insights on the particular location, particular sites, and, and some, for example, there is here I show one example. That is, a, this is a protein, one of my favorite proteins it's called a protein kinase. What it does is to uh, so modify other proteins by adding a phosphate group. And this is a procedure is called a protein phosphorylation. And this procedure is uh, original. We have no idea how this, uh, this is done. And only after the structure is solved, we get to know, okay, there's a two, this structure has two lobes, okay? Two lobes and in between, there is a pocket where we host the, the uh, molecule called ATP, where it's, uh, it's, one, it's one of the most important energy molecule and also carry the, the phosphate group that is needed to be transferred into the substrate, which is a peptide or a fragment of another protein. And after this procedure, the phosphate is transferred to some of the residues on the substrate and thus perform a, a molecular switch function and turn on and off another protein's function. Okay, so structure basically provides a lot of insights on the on the function. So therefore, the protein structure protein is still one of the is still a, a very important task is still maintain, may, remains one of the most uh, challenging problem in computational biology. So the task of the protein structure prediction, and also uh, sometimes people also call this a generalized version of protein folding, is that we're given an input sequence, amino acid sequence, and through whatever uh, com fancy computational approach you want to get, it's a three-dimensional structure on the right side, okay? And uh, there are a lot of... Uh, very successful prediction algorithm, including Rosetta, RaptorX, Atessa, and the, the newest uh, version of AlphaFold. And I also show you here this uh, progress of uh, these uh, different uh, the prediction power uh, collectively in the field across uh, uh, through the past uh, few years. And here, I, what I use is a, a metric that is used, uh, is used in in the recent CASP competitions where the community, entire community come together and evaluate their, their, their algorithms on, on some new proteins, unreleased proteins, and see whether predict structure has a certain level of accuracy. So I only showed you here the, the, the plot until 2018 because there's a huge improvement in, in, the, in the most recent CASP in 2020. But here, what's important is that I want to highlight that in the first, for example, in the in the in the middle of this maybe 10, 10, 20 years or so, we don't see much improvement. Okay, many of them improvement can uh, can be credited to the the increase of the data. Okay, so we got a templates, we got a similar structures um, that we can use them to make prediction. But most recently, you can see there's huge improvement that is 
that that greatly increase the performance of the structure prediction. So why is that? We just I just show you the two reasons I believe that to be true. One is that the machine learning the machine learning algorithms start to to become very powerful and can leverage a lot of data that we can make a reasonable prediction. Another is that we have a, a paradigm shift on how we do structure prediction. Previously, most reliable approach will be the template based, but now we're more into the the, the regime there where we use co-evolution analysis and which rely on the contact prediction. Okay. So first I would like to 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 show the current status of program structure prediction and what we have been doing in, in this field. And currently there are two different approaches. As I just mentioned, there are two different approaches for protein structure prediction. So we're given first step, but the first step is always the same. So we're given a protein sequence we use sequence search algorithms to find all the homologous sequences and build this what we call as multiple sequence alignment, okay? And traditionally the best approach, most reliable is called template-based modeling, where we build some model, hidden mark models or some kind of, of sequence profile, and we search against this a database. There's a structured database called a PDB, and we identify all these kind of possible templates and we extract the distances, pairwise distances or geometric constraints from these templates. You can think of the naive way would be that we copy the coordinates from the templates and put them together, blend them together. Somehow we build a, this backbone structure and then we add a side chain to the structure, okay? But these methods has been very well, like a, although it has a, it's very reliable, but it's a hit to the uh, some bottleneck that we can, there's an upper bound, we cannot further improve the performance of template-based modeling for quite a few years. And most recently, these years, the new paradigm will be this, this what we call a contact-assisted modeling, where we rely on this um, information within this uh, alignment. So we extract the, some, something like a correlation between or among these different sites, and we predict the we predict whether these two residues, the two MNS will be spatially close, okay, according to the correlation in the alignment. So this is called a co-evolution analysis. And also with the deep learning models, we'll be able to predict a lot of properties, a lot of um, constraints um, regarding the pairwise residue residue interaction. For example, whether they're close by or their orientations to be, to, to be meaningful. And with this constraint pr to predict it, we can use them to, to optimize the backbone and obtain some really good um, structure, initial structure. And further, we can also add a set of chains. We perform some, some type of um, uh, structure refinement, okay? So, so here the core concept is based on this co-evolution. So here I show you why this is a, this is a good uh, intuition. So basically here we have a, uh, he, after we build this multiple sequence alignment, we'll look at these the two columns. And if we have a way to evaluate the strengths of the co-evolution of these two sites, well, for example, here, the e EIJ, this is a term that is used to quantify the choices of these, for example, two different, uh, different uh, amino acids. And this absolute value will give us the strength of how they, whether they like to co-occur or they don't like to to, 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 to occur together, okay? And this is biological meaningful. Consider, for example, consider on the right the structure, we have the three residues, and these two, the red one and the blue one tend to be interacting with each other and, and because they're close spatial close by. And when we mutate one, one substitute one residue to another amino acid, the other one you would like to also be be, be mutated or substituted accordingly. And on the other hand, the remote one, for example, the orange one will be far from them. So the choice of the orange one has usually has nothing to do with the choice of those two. So this is a basic concept. So essentially we have this assumption that evolution and a structure are, are this constraint that should, should, be, should, should be similar to each other in terms of uh, these uh, residue interactions, okay? so. Here's a model usually people do like this is how we actually capture this kind of interaction. So the naive model people use is called this is, is based on the, uh, for example, this PWM or position specific scoring matrix. These are based on assumption that each of these location is, uh, is independent, okay? And so here we have a different way to write this and uh, 
this is a through an energy-based representation. So we have the single potentials, which means that the choices of these letters on the ice position has nothing to do with the other sides. Okay, but this uh, pairwise-based approach should actually give us a way to learn the coupling, this coevolution stress. Here we introduce another term that is a sum over all these pairwise potentials, which give us a coevolution stress. And this, this particular formulation is very well studied in, in machine learning, in statistical physics, and, and, and in high difference statistics, where it has different names, Markov random fields, Ising model, or undirected graphical model. Okay, so to solve this, um, uh, this, uh, this, um, this model, which is that we want to learn these strengths from the data, for example, singleton potentials, pairwise potential, where this is mostly critical one, we need to solve some problem that are related to the maximizing the data likelihood, which is shown here. And here there's a partition function, which makes the problem computationally very hard. So there are a lot of uh, approaches have been developed to, for approximation. So there are mean field approximation, Gaussian approximation, pseudo likelihood approximation, they all give different versions of, uh, of the evolution, co-evolution analysis. And people have shown that these are much better than the normal correlation analysis, which is for discrete variables, we call them the mutual information here. Okay, so what is mostly exciting about this is that now we have the way to, to show that uh, the, uh, the correlation between the size, but it's also very noisy. So what we have, my group has really changed the field, I think changed the field and uh, initiated this, uh, this, uh, this um, um, introduction of deep learning to the field is that we leverage some of the some of the intuition we got from natural image recognition. For example, here, this is a uh, classic uh, deep new convolution neural network. It is very useful to helpful to recognize imaging patterns. For example, these different patches, we can organize these different patches in a hierarchical way to give some output, okay? And, and uh, here we also treat this uh, protein, like uh, for example, co-evolution data, Evolution, we also call evolution of couplings as image. Okay, we also look at the local patterns in this uh, evolution uh, coupling matrix, and then we apply this hierarchical deep learning model to put in, put all this signal together in a hierarchical manner, and then predict the distance contact map. Okay, this can be binary, which means that whether they're close by, these uh, residues are close by in space, or we can just predict the distance. Okay, and and this is our model. So we, we build this model, we learn from the co-evolution. You can see this are a very noisy signal. Okay. And then we go through all this, this hierarchy, this is a this is a hierarchical neural network, a deep con convolution neural network, integrate all kinds of features. And on, on the on bottom, you can see that we basically this model denoise the original, the uh, co-evolution patterns, and we also generate this. Uh, the contact map looks very similar to the actual contact structure. Okay, so here is a, another example. This is actually the distance matrix we, we see, okay, from the native structure. This is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the program we use to generate the input for the neural network and it looks very, you can see there's some, some pattern, but very noisy. And this is uh, the version after we apply the deep contacts, the neural network to the, the CSM Pratt. So what we got here is that we use this new, this generated this, uh, this uh, the, uh, the contact map to help fold the new structure. So we tested it in CASP 12. You can see that it generated much better structure than the original input. And we were, and, 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 and the, our program is also ranked among the top in CASP 12 um, a few years ago. Okay. So why does machine learning, deep learning work for for this particular problem. So we actually perform some visualization. You can see that here we look, take the first layer filters and visualize into 2D and we color them according to secondary structure. You can see that this parallel or anti, this parallel or anti-parallel patterns of beta strands are all these kind of diagonal or anti-diagonal patterns. And for helical helical interactions, we see this kind of spaced, uh, spaced patterns, which corresponds to the, the gap corresponds to the, the space between them, corresponds to the number of residues in each turn of the alpha helical. So, so this corresponds, this visualization show that with the deep neural network we actually learn something that is meaningful. And at a higher layer, these patterns are organized into higher, like the more complex structure motifs for structure prediction. So, 
Okay, after this, many groups have developed different approaches for you know, Raptor X, AlphaFold, and Rosetta. They all are based on the similar intuition, building the uh, extracting the patterns from um, from the coevolution data and predicting the residue residue interaction and some other angle properties like inter residue uh, angles, and they have been also shown to be successful. But what's mostly interesting is that what happened last year that in in CASP 14, DeepMind's approach, they have some component related to the previous, uh, the, the, what I just described, but they greatly improve the performance, okay? You can see that uh, the GDT, which is score between zero and 100, 100 means perfect prediction, and the alpha fold is able to, to give a score close to 90, and this 90 is about the, the variance between, this about the, 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 the the consistency between the two structures sold by the two different groups. Okay, so here I also show you down there. There are very challenging two structures. I tried all different approaches and existing algorithms, and the, these are the structures from SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. And all existing structure uh, structure prediction algorithm cannot make any reasonable prediction for these two. Basically, we just got a random prediction, but alpha four two is able to generate a prediction that it looks almost perfect, okay? So which I think is very impressive, okay? So in the rest of the, the, this talk, I'll be uh, uh, move a little bit away from structure prediction, but focus on the function prediction. So beyond the structure prediction, what we really wanted to know, like you understand, uh, is actually the, the protein function. That is, we're given a protein structure or sequence we want to understand its function. It has a lot of uh, applications, for example, we can use it to improve. If we have such a model, we can use it to improve binding affinity of antibodies, optimize fluorescent proteins, or even improve, in, uh, improve the specificity of, uh, uh, of uh, gene, gene editing. Okay, so what, is, what do we need to be able to have such a model from a machine learning perspective? So essentially we want a model that takes a sequence as input and give an output, which is a function value. Okay, so the model that is useful for function prediction has some needs some some there should be some requirements. For example, we need to the model to be sensitive enough to differentiate the function level of very similar sequences. Okay, because sometimes we know introducing important residue will completely change the function. And we also need to model the non-additive effect, epistasis, and interact changes of uh, these uh, different residues may have interactions. And we also need to this model to be good enough to generalize to unseen sequences and mutations. Okay, so my group has developed quite a few different machine learning based approaches for modeling this, uh, this uh, for modeling the protein function from sequence. For example, we have this uh, uh, recurrent neural network versions. We also have the, the model that takes the, both the protein sequence and the, and the substrates as input using the convolution neural networks. And we also have uh, applied this different approach to different applications, including phosphorylation, protein RNA binding, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the protein drug binding, okay? So all of these, uh, these different applications requires a lot of data to train the model, okay? So, but in practice, we don't have a lot of data. The label data is expensive to get. So there are quite, there has been a lot of ideas in the machine learning community we can borrow that can be applied here. So one idea is that we can use unsupervised learning to learn good representations using language models, okay? So these, labels, these data are very easy to obtain. We don't have labels, but they present some kind of a good uh, representation of, of, of the protein or the sequences, okay? So basically the idea is that we have the sum of the sequence, the residues we have seen, MNIC that we have seen, we want to predict what we will see next. And there are other models like transformer models, which will, will is more complex, but it's also able to, to learn to make such predictions. So these approaches can be trained, these models, large models can be trained on the PFM or Uniport with, large, with a lot of sequence, but without any labels related to their function. Okay, but the uh, drawback of these approaches are too general. Maybe they will just capture second structure, solve an accessibility, some of this basic grammar of uh, this protein sequence, but we're not specific enough to reflect what the special function we want to study. Okay, another idea we take is, uh, is from, is similar to what I have uh, before is that we can learn from evolution. So here we can build the sequence alignment 
And uh, we assume that uh, all these sequences have some native function and they have or passed the uh, selection step during evolution. So we can treat those as weakly labeled data. We know they have survived through the evolution. We know the they can be treated as a positive data somehow. And these data are not a lot, right? We know that there are not a lot of data to train very complex deep learning model, but they're good enough to attract uh, good features. So what, what we have done uh, is that uh, one thing we, first thing we did is that we can check whether this kind of evolution patterns actually correlates with functions. So on the left, we have them experiment data from uh, deep mutational scanning like pairwise deep mutation scanning. And on the right, we have this model we have sh shown you before to, each, to compute the co-evolution pattern. And we actually check whether they correlated. And uh, in our different sites, they have different correlations, but on average, if we have a lot of homologous sequence in the, uh, in the alignment, we tend to have a stronger correlation. Okay, so this gives us some insight that we can actually use co-evolution patterns to form features. Okay, so this is our model. We, have, we call this uh, ECNAT by integrating evolutionary context, global context, and local context for, structure func for protein function prediction. So on the top, we use a global model, language model, to attract the pro sequence representations. And, uh, and also on the local, we have this model that it learned from a multiple sequence. I mean, those are homologous sequence, very similar sequence, closed sequences. And we use them to learn these, these um, specific and these um, the, uh, features that are uh, sensitive to mutations. And then we use our favorite model to, to integrate all these features together and so that to predict the uh, protein function. So we have evaluated this on a large collection of uh, deep mutation scanning data. These are single mutation data sets and we perform rigorous cross validation and show that it works much better than the previous uh, unsupervised versions, such as the EV fold or deep sequence, and also better than the supervised model that is uh, the base uh, developed by the machine learning community. Okay, so we have also tested the generalization, generalization of this model to high order mutations. And you can see that on the left, we tested on the GFP. And uh, seems like with a single and a double mutation, we'll be able to predict the very high order mutation, which means that maybe the pairwise, the high order mute interactions may not be that important. The pairwise might be good enough. And on the right, we also tested that the, uh, collect the literature um, data on these uh, resistant TEM. This is uh, uh, beta lactamus and show that our model is able to differentiate these, uh, these uh, an antibiotic resistant alleles against the random alleles, okay? So finally, we apply this to, to actually engineer the, uh, the inhibitor-resistant uh, beta-lactamus. So we take the structure, the sequence structure, we use our ECNAT to design a collection to, uh, of uh, mut mutants with high order mutations, and we check whether they are resistant to, to um, a very important uh, antibiotic compound, ampicillin. And, uh, and we tested it on across different uh, uh, concentrations. And we have a, here, I also show there, here we have two different models and we also have the positive controls. There are very, very handful of positive controls in the literature. We collect only, uh, we ex examine all the literature, only collect a very few number of them, which means that this is a very hard to engineer protein. And we did the, the, the uh, we, have, we replicate this experiment multiple times and show that actually our heat rate is really pretty good when the concentration is high. Okay, so finally, I would like to, 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 to thank, thank the audience, thank you all, and also thank my students and my collaborators and all the funding agency. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so thank much. very much, Jentang. So the way this is going to work in, in the sessions is we'll have a very brief Q&A after each talk, and then we'll have a lot of time at the end of the session. We'll have 30 minutes at the end to, to have a, a, a broader discussion. So just quickly, let me uh, ask one question um, from, from the audience. How did you decide the size of the images in the coevolution, um, presumably as input to the convolutional neural networks you, you talked about, with different image sizes cause learning of different relationships between correlated patterns. Right, to, to prepare the input, we first uh, uh, compute the evolution couplings and the summary that writes those values for each pair of uh, 
for each pair of positions. So essentially, if you have a protein with length L, you got an L by L matrix of the input. Now, of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, engineering to, needs to be done, for example, because we don't have large like a RAM GPUs, we have to cut the proteins into meaningful domains. So there's a we in, in the current version, we mainly only consider the we intra domain interactions, not intra domain interactions. And, uh, you, um, and that will make the engineer much easier to do. And uh, I know there are a lot of other groups who also consider inter domain interactions and the protein protein interactions. And uh, there are some other like kind of input needs to be prepared and also the uh, the evolution and patterns needs to be to to be to be uh, formatted in a different way. So so it's essentially this is a um, in practice, we mainly consider the, the uh, whether we can actually implement the algorithm is, is like um, run them in, the, in, in, in with a sufficient uh, with a given resources not uh, related to whether we want to. It's not that we want to cut them into pieces. It's, it's mainly an uh, engineering consideration. Great. Uh, another question um, is what is the success metric used for 3D structure prediction? Maybe you can say a little bit more about how it works. Yeah. So usually the uh, the 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 um, there are quite a few different metrics people use in the field, but what they are they are trying they they, they do are pretty similar. So given uh, predicted three dimensional structure and uh, uh, and a native structure, well, usually the first time first step we will do is a superimpose those two geometric objects. There are a lot of algorithms to do that. After doing that, we just check whether the, the deviation between the predicted residue position, usually we consider, for example, the backbone atoms, the alpha atoms, and what, how, how far that each predicted C alpha atom, atom is from the, the native atom. And then we compute the, for example, like uh, we can set a certain threshold as maybe we can consider like, a, for example, one angstrom to be meaningful, two angstrom to be meaningful. Then we can summarize a fraction of the correctly predicted uh, to, to the uh, um, uh, percentage of the corrected predicted residues. And so this is usually people do, for example, GTT score I mentioned here is uh, computing this way with by averaging multiple threshold. There are also some other metrics people use, for example, comparing the uh, their pairwise distance, but all of them have the similar manner. So usually people summarize that between due to a score between zero and 100 or zero and one, one means perfect, zero mean, mean, means not meaningful. Okay, great. So to stay on time, let's let's move on now to the second speaker. And again, we'll have lots of time after after the session uh, to discuss more. Excellent. So our second speaker will be Sarah Matheson, who is an assistant professor of computer science in Haver Haverford College. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Matheson. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Haverford College in the Department of Computer Science. And I'm very happy to be here for the machine learning in genomics workshop um, today. And specifically, I'm going to talk about generative adversarial networks and their use in population genetics. Um, but more broadly, I want to give a sense of where we're going um, in, in machine learning and, and, and population genetics and, and also kind of the shifts that have happened over time in the field. So the, one of the big questions in, in population genetics is how do we go from all of the simulated data, all, all of the sequence data, um, and actually learn something about evolution? So here I have um, this big matrix of zeros and ones representing a bunch of different samples um, and a bunch of different SNPs for these samples. And say I want to learn something like recombination hotspots or something about the recombination landscape. But I don't want to do this just for these particular, um, this particular sample or just for this particular problem of recombination. I want to do this more generally in any species that I'm interested in and maybe any uh, evolutionary phenomenon that I'm interested in as well, say heritable traits or diseases, um, admixture, natural selection. I don't want to have to redo the entire method every time that I change, um, change the application or, or change the species. And so if I were to think about what are the properties that I really want for this type of method, I would definitely want it to be fast and flexible, and maybe I would want it to be a, a machine learning method. So I think there's been several shifts in population genetics recently, and one of them was, was toward machine learning in around kind of 2010 timeframe, and then um, a, a second shift um, that, that started to move away from summary statistics. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, one of my ongoing projects in, in my lab about using generative um, adversarial networks and, and adversarial training more generally to create simulated data. 
Um, so what about this first uh, shift toward machine learning? So I think one of the one of the papers that really highlights this nicely was in 2013, um, uh, this paper that was uh, trying to identify regions as either neutral or under uh, natural selection, so a binary classification problem. Um, and one of the observations, which has, has been known for, for a long time, is that selection distorts um, properties of genomic data. And um, in, in particular, this is highlighted in the site frequency spectrum, which is a common summary statistic. And so in, in these figures, um, the, the uh, blue line here, it shows a neutral region and what the site frequency spectrum would look like. And these uh, red, red curves show what, what it would look like under uh, natural selection in, in a ver variety of different scenarios. Um, so could machine learning, which is known to be good at pattern detection and, and, and highlighting um, and, and picking out subtle signals, um, could it be uh, used to actually detect natural selection? And so the authors showed that it could, and their method that they used was um, a more classical machine learning method of the support vector machine. And broadly how this works is that uh, neutral regions are, are simulated in this case of natural selection um, shown in red here, and then uh, regions under selection shown in blue here um, are simulated as well. And the idea of this model is to try to identify some boundary or some uh, barrier between these two different um, types of, of regions. And if we're able to fit that boundary very well, then if a new data set um, comes along, say a real region that we're trying to um, uh, see if it's under selection or not, um, then we can plot it in the statistics space and actually see which side of the boundary it's on. So in this case, we would probably identify this region of real data as predicted as under selection. I think this is a really nice example of how machine learning um, had started to be, be used because it was very good at, at finding signals from summary statistics. But the issue arises in the case when we don't really know what summary statistics are good, or maybe we have a lot of summary statistics available. Um, here are a bunch of common ones I used for um, a, a project around 2016. And we don't really know if we change our problem of interest, do we need to change our summary statistics, or do we need to invent new summary statistics? So one, one uh, usage of machine learning is, is really to identify um, in, important features or distill down combinations of features that will be really useful for a problem of interest. Um, so what we decided to do was feed all of these summary statistics into a deep learning method. Um, the deep here just means, you know, these multiple layers and actually infer um, uh, both selection and population size changes. So here represented as um, this simple bottleneck model, but jointly inferred along with natural selection. And the idea was that this deep learning method could actually distill down information um, within these summary statistics, creating um, uh, groups of summary statistics or features built out of summary statistics that would be informative for these parameters. Um, so I think these, there's, there was a lot of, um, of uh, activity in mach machine learning around this time, but one of the drawbacks was that it still relied on these summary statistics. And so then there was a second shift um, away from summary statistics toward trying to use this raw data. And part of my motivation for mo moving away from summary statistics was actually to not have to change them for every application and not have to think about um, uh, inventing new ones for every single um, new problem that I'm interested in. So for this, uh, I think several groups drew inspiration from convolutional neural networks or CNNs. And um, these have been developed in, in a lot of the image uh, recognition and classification literature. And very, very broadly, um, one of the key ideas of CNNs is that um, the these little filters um, could pick up on um, different aspects of, of these images. So say, for example, um, maybe this filter would learn to identify beaks or feathers. And then if those filters um, sort of lit up in classification, then we might be more likely to include that the, conclude that this image is uh, of a bird. So the, the idea was that these uh, learned filters could be um, used in genetics to try to find out which aspects of um, the data were really um, informative for certain parameters of interest. 
However, there are a few issues in this. Um, uh, one being that these filters are really um, specialized for images, um, but they, they are not really specialized for genetic data. Um, and the second issue is that for, um, say, an unstructured population where this, the order of the individuals um, is, is not really informative at all, we don't want to encode that into our network architecture. So for an image, if we imagine just sort of shuffling all of the different pixel rows of the image, it wouldn't mean anything anymore. Um, but for genetic data, we want to say that's actually okay, that's actually the same data set. Um, so I'll focus, there's a few methods um, during this time that worked on CNNs for genetics, and I'll focus on the second one, um, where we were trying to create an architecture that would actually um, sort of respect some of the properties of the underlying data. So for this, we looked at our, our raw data as, again, a series of uh, zeros and ones in, in a matrix, but the samples or the rows are now exchangeable. And um, we fed this not through these square filters, um, but actually used filters of height one. Um, so these filters actually only, um, uh, only span one haplotype um, or one sample. And thus they didn't um, encode any information about the ordering of, of the samples in this network. And then we did that for several layers um, to that, to, to make sure that we weren't assuming anything about the order. And then um, toward the end of the network, we actually collapsed along um, all of the rows. And, and so that would give us something that was also um, a permutation invariant. So there are lots of different permutation invariant functions we could choose here. Um, some max average are all permutation invariant. Um, and this, this allowed us to kind of distill down some of the information that had been learned in the previous layers. And then finally, we can um, infer some evolutionary parameter uh, that we are interested in. So this, uh, this network um, uh, was able, uh, able to work quite well on, um, on a few different types of problems. One, one example is actually looking at recombination hotspots. So a, a binary classification of either um, a region inside a hotspot or not. And we plotted um, over the training iterations, we plotted the accuracy. Um, and we found that for this blue line here, this was the exchangeable architecture or the permutation invariant architecture. Um, we were able to get higher accuracy than if we just used um, some of the more image, uh, image oriented CNNs shown in these, in, in these other curves here. Um, so really um, explicitly encoding the nature of the data was able to help us um, uh, perform better in this, in this network. So this was, uh, there was um, several different CNN methods developed during this time, and I think it was a huge step forward for the field. Um, but one thing I've kind of glossed over is that we still need simulated data for these machine learning methods. And actually it's very important for machine learning methods in genetics to have simulated data as the training data, since we don't really have any real examples where the evolutionary history would be known. Or in other words, we need to use supervised learning because we don't really, um, we need to use supervised learning and therefore we need the labels and we don't really have the labels of, of any real data. So we really rely heavily on that simulated data. So I became very interested in developing better simulated data. And this was inspired by um, several, several times when I tried to create um, realistic simulated data and gave my sort of best guess at the parameters. And I still was not really able to accurately capture some of the features of the real data. So here are a few examples um, where the real and the simulated data sets um, look very different. Um, and here as well, even when I tried to put in sort of reasonable parameters for these, um, for these uh, simulation programs. And as a, as a broader point, the role of simulated data in population genetics can really not be overstated. It is useful not only for training these machine learning methods, but for validating methods, developing intuition, it's, it's extremely important. And to that effect, many different um, uh, simulation uh, programs have been developed over the years. And two of the um, most popular ones uh, right now are, are SLIM and MS Prime. And these, these programs work very well at, at recapitulating evolution, but they do require many input parameters. And so it's very, it can be very difficult to really identify what are the best ones. And here are some examples where this, where this didn't really work. 
So I was interested in trying out um, generative approaches and specifically uh, generative, um, generative adversarial networks. Um, and the idea behind these GAN algorithms um, is that our initial guess at whatever type of simulation we're trying to come up with is probably going to be pretty poor quality, right? If we just guess, we're, we're not gonna be able to um, develop a really good simulation right off the bat. Um, so to draw an analogy from the art world, say we are a forger and we're trying to make um, sort of fake artworks and, you know, um, in the style of famous artists. And so if we just try this and we, we're starting out, we're not very experienced and we just try this, um, our, our uh, fake data might look like this. And so now it's pretty easy for, say, an art critic to determine, well, one of these is fake and one of these is real. So say we go off and we say, okay, well, that wasn't very good, but we try to train more and we learn more about art and we try again. And maybe this time we're a little bit better. So um, we, we try this uh, uh, example on the left, but it still doesn't really look like a real Picasso on the right. Um, so we, we go off and we train more and we learn more about art and we try again. And um, I'm not sure what these uh, look like to you, but to me, they look pretty realistic. Um, but it kind of turns out that both of these are suspected to be fake Jackson Pollocks. Okay, so kind of uh, being a bit more detailed, um, if we were to think about what a GAN architecture really looks like, it has these two components. It has this generator, um, or we can think of that as a forger, that's trying to create these um, synthetic examples. And then we have the discriminator, we can think of the art critic, that's actually trying to identify this um, real versus fake. And an important part about the discriminator is that um, they have to make a binary classification at the end of the day, whether that example is, is real or fake. And as part of this feedback loop, um, based on that information, the generator tries to perform better. And so eventually both of these entities will become better over time with the generator creating more and more realistic data. And then because of that, the discriminator has to get better too and identify these subtle differences to try and identify which are real and which are fake. Um, so this is kind of the, the broad idea and this has been used um, in images before, but for population genetics, there's um, quite a lot of modifications we need to make to really get this to work in, in, in a new system. Um, so what we did is designed a new um, uh, uh, GAN framework for, um, for population genetics, which we call PGGAN. And the idea is that we still are feeding in uh, generated data and real data into the discriminator. Um, and, and, and training the discriminator that way. But instead of the generator um, going right to, to, to simulating all these zeros and ones, um, I actually wanted to include an evolutionary model as part of the generation process. So instead, the generator needs to choose these parameters of say an evolutionary model, say these population sizes and one and two and three in this example and then feed those in to some evolutionary simulator and then create the generated data. And so because of uh, this, this um, unique generator architecture, um, we can no longer really use backpropagation or a lot of gradient descent style approaches because we don't have the gradient anymore. So to overcome this, we actually used a simulated annealing algorithm to select the parameters that we would feed into the evolutionary model. And the idea here is that um, we start out with being able to rapidly move across the parameter space um, in terms of our evolutionary parameters at the beginning. And then as this temperature cools down, we're able to um, make more uh, small refinements to our parameters until at the end, we should hopefully have parameters that generate data that is as realistic as possible and confuses the discriminator. So this was our, our generator. And then for the discriminator, um, uh, we chose to use a CNN. And for this CNN, we actually expanded on the permutation invariant CNN I talked about earlier to include multiple populations. And the idea here is that we, we want to in, uh, include a richer set of evolutionary models. So we need to handle uh, multiple populations. And within each population, the samples are permutation invariant, but between populations, they are not. 
And then after several layers of uh, convolutional layers and, and, and filters here, then we um, collapse along the, the, the rows and then concatenate the two populations together. And then instead of the output being a um, evolutionary parameter of interest, it's actually this binary output um, or probability of being real or fake. So we have this sort of binary classification problem. So to, before I talk about the results, um, I wanted to say just a little bit about um, what can go wrong in GAN training. GANs are notoriously um, difficult to train, and in part because there's two optimization problems, the generator and the discriminator, and they're, they're adversarial, so they're competing against each other. And so one of the things that can go wrong is that the discriminator classifies um, all data sets as real. So across these training iterations on the x-axis here, if we look at the accuracy on real and fake data, the discriminator is classifying, is 100% accurate on the real data, classifying everything as real, but 0% accurate, accurate on the fake data. And this is also represented in the loss where the generator loss is not very low. It can't really, it's not getting any positive feedback. It's just everything it does is classified as real. So there's no incentive for the generator to improve. So this is definitely um, a major thing that can go wrong. Um, in contrast, looking at examples of successful training, um, we see that in the beginning, usually the discriminator is very accurate, and then it reduces its accuracy over time to around 50%. And then at the end, it's really often confused and, and, and not, even though there's some back and forth, it's typically not able to really accurately determine uh, real or simulated. And at the end, the losses are balanced, meaning that they are the generator and the discriminator are, are both um, really, really working hard to, to, to do their jobs. So uh, one way of evaluating um, uh, this type of method is to look if there are some features of the real data that are accurately um, being captured um, by the simulations. So we looked at summary statistics here as a as a, a sanity check that our that our that our method was working. And so, so for one example, we looked at just a single population and here, um, here's CHB, um, which is an East Asian population. And if we just use a constant population size, then we didn't, you know, we weren't really capturing the real data very accurately or these, these green and gray curves were not very, very close together. Um, but if we used a, um, a, a more sophisticated model that actually included exponential growth and some um, time, time uh, size changes at different times, we we're actually able to much better fit the data. Um, we also looked at a two population model of uh, modeling the out of Africa uh, event um, with YRI and CEU, an African and European population. And, um, and we we're also able to really closely mirror the summary statistics here. And then we are also able to fit this model and, and just look at the parameters as another sort of sanity check that we were getting reasonable results. And we do see the out of Africa model, uh, out of Africa bottleneck and uh, re-expansion here in, in CEU, as well as some migration um, post split. So this was encouraging that this was broadly in line with, um, uh, with, with the existing literature. Um, so a, a little bit of um, uh, where we're going with, with machine learning. Um, I think there's many uh, different opportunities for PGGAN in particular, especially for studying under uh, studying understudied populations where we don't have a very good idea of what the default parameters would be. And then also overcoming this fundamental imbalance since we have unlimited um, simulated data, but limited real data. And I think more broadly, um, we, we really need to keep the data, data in mind and not just take off the shelf um, methods from other fields, but really think about what methods will be most applicable for our data and what modifications and new algorithms do we actually need for genetic data, such as um, uh, this permutation invariant architectures or um, a, a, a simulation um, a generators that don't rely on the gradient. I think uh, we really need um, machine learning methods to be more interpretable. Um, we don't really know what these CNNs are learning yet. And I think there's a lot of opportunities to combine machine learning and evolutionary modeling. So it's not one or the other. Um, and finally, I would say that um, I think we need to think more about moving away from simulations too and, and thinking more about unsupervised learning and learning from the real data directly. Um, and with that, I wanted to thank um, all my collaborators and funding and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Matheson. Uh, wonderful talk. 
Um, so I'll start with a few questions by our audience. Um, so first, you said that you needed simulated data for training supervised models. Are you also exploring unsupervised models? Yes, and I, I think that's a great question. And I think that part of where the motivation for the GAN framework came from is actually this exact idea is that we're not just using purely simulated data that we kind of make up based on our best guess, but we actually try to use the GAN to generate better simulated data. And that, and thus the real data is actually fed into the GAN and then that the simulated data tries to match that. So I think that that's kind of a hybrid approach in terms of it's not purely unsupervised, um, but we're trying to um, use the real data directly instead of at the very end after we've already trained on purely simulated data. I also think there's a few other groups in this area that are working on using unsupervised learning more directly in terms of visualization and clustering and things like that that would actually be really purely unsupervised without any training data at all. So I think there's much room for improvement though. I think I would definitely encourage people to kind of think about this area of unsupervised learning in, in uh, population genetics. Great, thanks Sarah. I'll, I'll ask this last question by Zhang Yun. For the SNPs data as input to the convolutional neural network model, uh, they assume zero and one refer to the number of minor alleles. Have you tried the zero, one, two uh, type input in your models and, and uh, how to optimize the stride in the CNN model? That's a great question. So yeah, zero refers to the minor allele and one refers to the, um, uh, or zero refers to the major allele and one refers to the minor allele. You can also, if you know your ancestral derived state, you can have zero as the ancestral state and one as the derived state. That would also, um, that would also work. Um, I think if, it would be interesting to try other approaches. You can also try like a negative one, one, and then zero is for missing data, which I think could, could be better in cases when you um, the quality is less good. Um, in, in terms of increasing the number, I mean, usually we really see biallelic SNPs and that's why you don't sort of see higher numbers, but I think there's no reason not to include them if that's better for your model. I think you just have to be really careful, you know, because we're using ReLU and all these sort of different activation functions, you need to be careful about where is your zero mark and what are you really assuming that, you know, you don't want everything to be positive if, if those, are the th those are the things that are gonna be sort of filtered down your network. So you kind of have to be aware of that. Um, What do you think, Anthony? Shall we shall we do one more, or shall we move on? Um, well, you know, there's a really good question, so maybe we'll do one more. Um, so, what type of loss functions do you use for imbalanced data, and do you apply any upsampling for unbalanced data? That that's a really interesting question about this sort of data imbalance. Um, for us, we try to simulate the exact number of real data sets we have, so we we kind of get around that a little bit with the with the balancing of the data. Um, I I think for generally we use this sort of like binary cross entropy loss functions for for the GANs. Um, I I can I can talk more about that in the in the main Q and A, um, but I think that. In, in, in general, there is this fundamental data imbalance, right? We have unlimited simulated data, we have limited real data. And so I think that needs to be further explored, but it's not something I've done yet. Okay, great, thank you, Sarah. So let's move to the final speaker of our session one. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Leslie from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Her talk is titled The 3D Genome and Predictive Gene Regulatory Models. Hi, my name is Christina Leslie. I'm at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and I want to talk to you about using machine learning uh, models together with uh, 3D genomic data uh, uh, to train um, predictive models of gene regulation. All right, so as I'm sure you're aware, gene regulation involves a collaboration of transcription factors that bind at the promoter as well as at the enhancers that can be quite distal from the promoter and DNA looping that brings enhancer elements in contact with the promoter and leads to upregulation of expression of the transcript. Uh, and for quite some time, we've used uh, 1D epigenomic data information on where transcription factors are binding. Uh, information about chromatin accessibility and histone marks 
uh, to map the presence of candidate enhancer elements, but we haven't used uh, uh, until recently the 3D connectivity of these elements. Okay, so why do we want to try to predict gene expression? Well, gene expression um, is important for the function of cells and for understanding uh, what cells do in different uh, states. And this is information or uh, data from one of my own papers, but there are many such studies where we're looking at chromatin states of, uh, in this case, CD8 T cells and functional T cells and T cells that progress to dysfunction in tumors. Okay. And what we can see by uh, looking at this chromatin accessibility at specific loci, so this is the locus that encodes PD-1 in the mouse. PD-1 is an immunotherapy target, and this is uh, uh, the locus of an important um, uh, effector, cytokine interferon gamma. And what happens uh, as um, T cells progress to a dysfunctional or exhausted state, there are chromatin accessibility changes at these loci different from when you get a factor or memory functional cells, okay? And these changes somehow encode the gain of expression of PD-1 and the loss of gene expression of interferon gamma. And we'd like to understand this and model this. Um, for NHGRI, it's also important uh, to link genetic variation to gene expression. Okay, and this is an example that's not from my lab, it's uh, uh, from a recent paper trying to understand uh, the um, association between uh, a genetic variation and gene expression of a particular gene, okay, uh, BLK here, as well as uh, doing association of genetic variation with chromatin accessibility and teasing apart how changes in the DNA sequence can change accessibility and uh, chromatin state, and that can change gene regulation. Okay, so ideally, we would like to have machine learning models that could automate this process. Um, in my own lab, uh, we've uh, done a lot of work in this domain trying to use um, uh, models uh, to uh, to predict gene expression or fold change between different cell states from the sequence content and the accessibility or activity of regulatory elements. And we're doing this not to predict per se, but in order to um, decipher gene regulation, figure out what the regulators are, figure out how individual genes are regulated. And the missing information in our models uh, so far has been the connectivity information, the connectivity of promoters and enhancers. So what I wanna show you today is using 3D interaction data in order to uh, um, model gene regulation using graph neural networks. Okay, so the data we're gonna use uh, is uh, chromosome confirmation capture data, uh, such as Hi c uh, Here's a picture um, of high C, uh, the, the basic idea is that you're cross-linking uh, proteins uh, to DNA in C2. Uh, you do a restriction enzyme digest so that you're cutting up the chromatin, you ligate and pull down and you get paired end reads where uh, the, the read pair maps a contact. So the pair of reads can be distal in the, in the 1D genome, but they had to be close in the cell in, in the input population. And this data allows us to build a contact matrix that uh, gives us information about 3D uh, proximity of genomic regions. All right, and um, we uh, can look at these contact matrices at different scales, at a genome-wide scale or chromosome-wide, um, but we're uh, more interested in uh, uh, these do domain level and um, loop level and individual promoter enhancer interaction level information. Okay, so if you zoom in uh, to these uh, maps close enough, you can see organization like topologically associated domains. And within these tads, 
you can see some loops between genomic loci. Okay, um, methods matter. So uh, in our lab, we've developed our own statistical approaches to uh, infer uh, uh, interactions, significant interactions uh, directly from count data. And um, we call this method high CDC for high C direct caller. Um, so as essentially what we're trying to do is uh, uh, estimate a background model from the count data using negative binomial regression. The covariates that are important are um, the genomic distance, as well as um, features of the, the, the interaction bins, uh, such as mappability, uh, number of restriction enzyme size, GC content. And when we fit our model, we can observe the counts and um, uh, decide how surprised we are to see a high count and assign a p-value or a z-score. Okay, and uh, this uh, latest version, High CDC Plus, is uh, in revision, hopefully coming out soon. And when we can do that, we can start to see uh, interactions that are of interest to us for modeling gene regulation. So this is data uh, from Danwei Huangfu's lab in uh, collaboration uh, uh, for our 4D nucleon project that also involves FE apostolu. Um, and what we're looking at is a progression of guided differentiation of human embryonic stem cells towards ins insulin secreting beta cells, okay? And um, looking at these different stages of pancreatic differentiation, standard normalization at the top and high CDC normalization with Z-scores um, at the bottom. And what we can see is uh, certain uh, 3D interactions beginning to get set up uh, that uh, uh, influence the promoter of this important um, diabetes gene PDX1. Okay, so we would like to understand uh, how at different stages of differentiation, this enhancer rewiring uh, influences expression of the target gene. Okay, so uh, now I, I'm gonna get to the machine learning part. Uh, and, and tell you about a model that we've developed called GraphRig, um, where we're using graph neural networks uh, to infer gene regulatory models, okay? And the idea is we're gonna use um, high c or we're actually gonna use a variant called high chip um, to encode 3D interactions, regulatory interactions as a graph. And we're gonna propagate information along these edges in the graph via graph neural networks. Okay, so we think of the linear genome as a set of bins. Uh, the bins are connected by edges that we get from high chip data. Um, the input features are gonna be either uh, 1D epigenomic data or DNA sequence, and the output is gonna be gene expression. Okay, so the expression output of each bin. Okay, um, so we have two models, one that uses epigenome-based uh, uh, data and one that uses DNA sequence. So I'm going to talk about the epigenome-based uh, uh, graphic first. Okay, with this model, what we do is um, the inputs are chromatin accessibility and a minimal set of histone um, modifications. Uh, we actually just use one promoter mark and one enhancer activity mark. Okay. We go through a few CNN layers, and this helps us learn local features of the, of the chromatin. And then we pass through several graph attention network uh, layers, and this allows us to pass information between um, uh, enhancers and promoters. And then we predict the promoter output um, as measured by CAGE-seq, okay, which um, is a tag-based protocol that maps um, promoter activity, the output at specific transcription start sites. Okay, so roughly speaking, this model predicts gene expression from the activity and connectivity of regulatory elements. Um, this model is also cell type agnostic in the sense that uh, if you train in one cell type, you can go to a new cell type. And as long as you have uh, inputs, 1D and 3D inputs for the new cell type, you could predict expression there. All right, uh, just a, a, a few more data. 
uh, uh, in information <laughs> details on, on the model. We're using DNAs, we're using HCK4 trimethyl and H3K27 acetyl, um, and uh, a finer binning for uh, uh, the histone marks. But by the time we get to uh, the, the um, graph attention network, we're at a 5 kb binning. Okay, so and and um, we are predicting at this bin, uh, this resolution, the cage seek. Okay, and um, we're making a prediction on fairly large uh, genomic regions of about two megabases. Okay, how well can we do? We actually can do quite well. All right, so this is um, true signal versus predicted signal on Halbert chromosomes. Uh, in mouse yes cells, and you can see a nice correlation. Um, also, if you train the model um, in different cell types, and then again on how about chromosomes, uh, try to use um, um, these models to predict full change, again, the full change looks good. Here, the color, the darker color means that you um, are looking at uh, uh, promoters with more high chip edges. Okay, so um, they have more complicated regulation. Okay, the other model, the sequence-based model, we start with six megabases of uh, DNA sequence, one hot encoded. We pass through a few CNN layers, again, to learn local features, so now sequence motifs. And then we pass through dilated convolutional neural network uh, um, layers in the bottom path to predict accessibility and histone marks, okay? Uh, there's another path through the model where we take um, the output of this CNN, these motifs, and we pass to the graph attention network and try to predict uh, cage seq okay? So now um, we're using DNA sequence together with 3D uh, connectivity to predict both gene expression and to predict the 1D epigenomic data as an auxiliary task. Okay, this is definitely a cell type specific model uh, in that you're learning sequence information that is specific to the cell type that you train in. Okay, um, and just again, a few details on the model. The bottom path through the model is very similar to the dilated uh, CNN model uh, called the Senji developed by David Kelly. Okay, so these uh, sequence models um, that have been used in regulatory genomics. The novel part is the top path that uses the graph attention network. Okay, and again, the sequence model, uh, it's a harder task, um, but we can evaluate on health chromosomes and look at true expression versus predicted expression or full change um, versus predicted full change. And again, it's, it's a reasonable correlation. Okay, and, and finally, uh, I'm uh, uh, passing through this quickly, but uh, if you compare the prediction of either the epigenome or sequence-based model to the corresponding CNN model, okay, so CNNs are widely used now in regulatory genomics, uh, they're not incorporating 3D information, the graphic models do better. Okay, and in particular, they are more, um, uh, they, they give higher accuracy for prediction of gene expression when you start restricting to genes that are expressed and genes that have more complex regulation, more high chip edges. Okay, however, uh, unlike in a lot of machine learning, the prediction performance per se is not the point. We're doing this because we want to understand how gene regulation works and how individual genes are regulated. We want to interpret the model. So what we can do is use feature attribution uh, to uh, predict what are the functional enhancers for a specific gene. Okay, so what we're doing here, we look at a specific output. Uh, so expression of the gene DHPS and for all the input um, features, we can use a method called deep shap that um, identifies uh, which uh, bins of that feature contribute most to prediction. And we can sum up these contributions and get a track like this, which tells us 
which positions along the genome the model thinks are important for predicting this gene. Okay, and those, uh, that feature attribution approach gives us a prediction of, of where we think the functional enhancers are. Okay, there's data to evaluate this now. Um, and uh, this is thanks to uh, CRISPR-I based uh, uh, enhancer screening strategies. For example, uh, CRISPR-I Flowfish from the NGRITES lab. Okay, so this data, what they're doing is they're taking um, a particular gene of interest and they have a set of candidate uh, enhancers and they do a pooled CRISPR-I screen uh, uh, with the readout using RNA fish for the gene of interest. And they can, um, through sorting and sequencing, estimate uh, the uh, impact of perturbing individual enhancers on the expression, uh, the full change um, of, of the target gene. Okay. And in the same paper, they have a model for predicting functional enhancers called the activity by contact model. Um, this uh, is a score using accessibility, uh, acetylation, and high C contacts. Okay. So how do we compare with the ABC score or with standard CNN models? What we can show is that the graph regulatory models um, from GraphReg outperform these other approaches. Okay, so this is an evaluation on uh, flowfish data and K562 cells. Uh, this is the performance by area under the precision recall curve um, over a set of genes. Uh, in green is uh, ABC. Orange are um, the different GraphReg models. Blue are the corresponding CNN models. Okay, and so what you can see is that we have higher performance for uh, determining functional enhancers based on flowfish data, okay, uh, with the graph reg models in orange versus uh, CNN models or ABC, okay. And just a final slide uh, to uh, explain why graph reg can outperform CNNs uh, for this task. So what I'm showing is the MYC locus. Uh, MYC is an important gene, it's an oncogene. It's known to have very distal enhancers. Okay, so the promoter is here and um, I'm showing the high chip data. And uh, the question is, can these different models through um, a, a feature attribution, can, can we figure out whether they are um, able to detect these distal enhancers? And what you can see is both that the genome model uh, based models and the sequence based models, GraphReg can find um, these distal enhancers, whereas the CNNs can't. So uh, 1D uh, CNNs, the dilated CNNs, in principle have a wide receptive field, but actually the feature attribution shows they're only learning information very proximal to the promoter, okay? They can't access this distal information and that's the power of, of this approach. Okay, so uh, I showed you some new work uh, using graph neural networks to predict gene expression across uh, large uh, genomic regions using both 3D interaction data and 1D epigenomic data or using DNA sequence with 1D um, epigenomic uh, prediction as an auxiliary task. And I showed that the GraphReg models outperform the baseline uh, CNN models uh, for gene expression prediction. More importantly, we can use feature attribution to predict functional enhancers for genes, and this outperforms uh, existing models as well as the ABC score uh, for identifying functional enhancer elements. Okay, and I, I think the big picture here is that there have been rapid developments in machine learning modeling, in epigenomics, in 3D genomics, and also in um, screening uh, uh, approaches based on uh, CRISPR editing. Um, and this has all enabled advances in, in modeling gene regulation and deciphering uh, 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 regulation. Okay, with that, I wanna just thank all the people in my lab who did the work, 
uh, Ali Reza Karbala Gyare uh, uh, is the postdoc who developed GraphReg. Um, Marve Sahin um, developed uh, the high CDC plus package uh, with help from Wilfred Wong. And in particular, I want to thank uh, my collaborators, Effie Apostolou and Danwei Hwangfu, uh, as well as uh, funding sources. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Christina. So let's go to a couple of questions uh, just for this speaker before we move to the general discussion. I'll start with the first one by Jens Lichtenberg. How difficult would it be to infer the deconnectivity when assuming the other features such as epigenomic data and expression data are, are given or, or well known. And Christina, maybe we can just for the benefit of the audience, um, explain what, what is meant by the deconnectivity. The, the connectivity, uh, like the high, the high C contact map. Yeah, yeah, I'm guessing what they mean is the high C connectivity from this, from this question. Right. So, so that's a great question. Um, so, you know, uh, GraphReg uses uh, high C information, high chip information in the model to predict gene regulation. Another problem would be trying to use um, 1D epigenomic data to predict the contact matrix to predict. Exactly. Contact. And we and others are working on it. Um, uh, we are working on it in the context of using both bulk um, 1D epigenomic data, as well as using uh, single cell attack data, um, uh, sort of uh, using different um, deep learning approaches. There are existing approaches that um, go from DNA sequence to the contact matrix training in a specific cell type, but one doesn't expect those models to generalize to a new cell type. Um, you see another question from uh, Antonios uh, Lutzas, uh, which starts off with saying, uh, great work, uh, very exciting. Um, a lot of the work that you're presenting is uh, on population models. Uh, and I'm wondering if your ML models would benefit if by using single cell data uh, in addition. It's where we're going, <laughs> you know, so uh, I, I don't, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not quite ready to put it into the, the workshop slides, but um, we and many other people are looking at multi-ohm data where you have single cell attack and single cell RNA-seq in the same cells. And um, the cage-seq that we're using looks very much like the signal you get when you summarize uh, single cell data, especially certain certain kinds of assays over over cells, over clusters. So we are definitely heading in that direction, as as are many other people. Great. And actually, maybe I'll ask you a question on my own. Um, you know, in natural language processing, there was kind of a phase transition when transformer models came in. You know, and you see kind of the rise of BERT and GPT two and three. Uh, kind of your thoughts on whether transformers would be useful in this domain, which at least to me looks a little similar. Yes, I, I was actually just reading a, a paper yesterday, which is um, uh, from Calico and DeepMind, uh, David Kelly's. Uh, so it's a preprint, and our graph reg is also a preprint. So they're both available in BioArchive, and and they're using a transformer architecture. You know, so it's a different attention-based mechanism. They're not using 3D structure, but they can, um, through an attention mechanism, get some longer range interaction. Not quite the two megabases that we are getting, but that they can kind of learn information up to about 100 kb, which is impressive. OK, great. So why don't we go ahead and get all the speakers of the session up here? And we'll start the general discussion period. And you know, maybe uh, while we're waiting for some new questions to roll in, uh, I have a question uh, again uh, for Jan Peng. Uh, you know, it was kind of amazing to me how so much of the advance in protein structure came from methods that are based on information theory or evolution, uh, rather than from a bi biophysical approach. Uh, you know, your thoughts on why that is, and whether or not we'll actually get to a place 
where the biophysical approaches kind of catch up to the uh, more information theoretic approaches. Yeah, sure. So I think uh, uh, the uh, first, uh, the biophysical based approach has uh, their limits, right? There, uh, our kind of understanding on, for example, man and body interaction and the exact formulation of these, how this potential should be formulated are not complete where we have very, we, although there are a lot of progress in the field, we have, uh, we don't have a very much uh, understanding on uh, on these and also the biophysics based approach also suffer from uh, what we have seen in optimization. There are a lot of issues in optimization. Those energy functions are highly rugged. There are in the landscape, people have visualized that there are a lot of local minimum and those energy functions are really, really hard to optimize. So. So I think that's um, the main bottleneck of applying those approaches in, in large scale. And of course the computational cost of those uh, biophysical based approaches are really, really demanding. And we need a lot of uh, like uh, supercomputers to perform a lot of simulations and to get uh, some reasonable, reasonable folding or simulations. So I think the, the future direction might be the, like, as you said, the information based, information theoretical based or machine learning based plus physical based approaches. For example, in our approaches and also many other groups, especially also in deep minds approach, we're not just only use the, the deep learning approach. For example, for protein structure prediction, protein folding, what the machine learning is giving us is just the initial structure. We got this scaffold to be right. We know, for example, this particular residue should be placed in the, in, in the right direction. But uh, the details are are not good. So usually, what we do is that after we obtain the initial structure, we we use a force field or some of these biophysical based approach to opt optimize those atom detail, atomic details, a lot of side chain packing, orientation, etc. Because before we, if we don't have that, the structures globally they look correct. But if you look at the details, they 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 are not useful at all. So that's why people now use these kind of different approaches and put them together. And, and, uh, and machine learning, I would say, is very good at identifying a good starting point. After we find this good starting point, and then the biophysical model will be, be very helpful, useful to, to optimize the detail and get them fold into the right structure. So a question just came in that I have to say, I, I've been wondering during a number of these talks, and so I think it's a good general uh, question for everyone. How much data do you think is needed for genomic deep learning? And I would I would say you're welcome to comment more generally, but but start with your own research. And let's start with Christina Leslie because you know Christina during your talk I was wondering, you're you're running this thing obviously you're scanning it along the genome from chromosome to chromosome and you can you mentioned you can use one chromosome as a holdout to validate the the model and others. But is that is that just one individual? Uh, presumably, you have multiple individuals, and so we have these sort of at least two dimensions: number of nucleotides by number of, of samples. Is 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 that how I should think about this? Uh, and and how much data do I need in in both of those dimensions? So uh, let me point out that the data I'm showing you is training on a single cell type. So and it's you know encode cell line data or mouse CS uh, cell line. Um, and a lot of a lot of work so far has been at that level, or you know may, maybe you do a multitask where you're predicting all of encode, right? But fundamentally, it's um, predicting it from the reference genome. And as we move forward, it's not magic. We're, we're going to need to incorporate genetic variation into the models if we really want to learn what is the function of non-coding genetic variation on gene expression. So, and, and we're, we have some strategies, other people have uh, strategies as well, um, but that, that's the next step. But, but for instance, do you, do you have any estimation of, of how things will improve as more data are added, as more cell lines, for instance, are added to the, the repository? Is that gonna help? I don't know. <laughs> so I, I, I actually think instead of cell lines, I think we need primary cells looking at um, uh, differentiation stages, like in our 4DN project. We, we, we want to model something that is relevant um, both to uh, cell identity and 
you know, the biology of, of the, the, you know, fully differentiated cell and the biology of disease, right? So I, I, I think we should be training in, in, in more relevant contexts. In terms of learning, you know, so the epigenome-based model that I talked about where from a few marks and the connectivity, you know, you, you're, you're, we're learning something fairly modest about how um, uh, contributions of distal elements and, and, and the state, you know, helps us predict the level of expression output. And so it's not surprising in a sense that that does well, we have good information that can generalize to a new cell type pretty well, um, but it doesn't get us all the way to what does this, uh, you know, the, the, the minor allele change in regulation of an important developmental gene. So Sarah, how would you answer the question about how, so how much data are you using and and what are your views in general on on uh, you know obtaining more data and how it would impact the machine learning you're doing yeah i think it's a it's a different application than what christina was talking about but we still we do use the entire genome um, but we would do that for multiple individuals usually um, say 200 haplotypes, so 100 individuals. And I think it hasn't been explored enough, you know, how, how many we actually need to do well. Could we get away with fewer? You know, I think there's kind of some interesting questions there. And I think it depends on what you want to answer for natural selection. Um, you may need more individuals to really see that pattern for things like ancient population size changes and migrations and admixtures, you may need only fewer, fewer individuals. But I think in, in terms of, I'm also sort of, you know, chopping up the genome into regions and I'm trying to look at um, feeding each of those regions in almost as an image, right, to the GAN framework. So how many images do I need? I mean, I would say a lower bound would be something like 10,000. I mean, just to throw it out there. So I kind of would, there's a trade-off between taking more SNPs per region and having fewer regions versus taking fewer SNPs per region and having more regions, right? So I think there's a lot of exploration that needs to be done there, but we're kind of, for a GAN, we're limited in just the length of the genome, right? Whereas for some supervised machine learning method where you're using simulated data to train, there's no limit to the amount of da training data you have, right? It's just, is it actually good quality training data? Great, thanks. John, did you wanna comment as well? Yeah, I want to just add one comment that uh, although for for uh, for a lot of problems like we we don't have for example we don't have a lot of cell lines we don't have a lot of uh, uh, samples we don't have too many genomes or we don't have too many proteins to train all these models but essentially you think of all these like modern deep learning models they are trying to capture these uh, local patterns from very bottom and organized in a way that to come to get to come up together with more complex organized patterns. And a lot of these, uh, if you think of these local filters or local feature extractors at a very lo lower layer in these models, they, we actually get a lot of data, right? One, we have a uh, three billions of base pairs in the genome, each of this region can be seen as individual data points. Do, of course, depends on what kind of task we want to do. Like uh, for example, for proteins, like we don't have a lot of protein soft, although uh, much more than we've seen in the past, but essentially what we're trying to do is find all these interacting motifs. Those are local, local interactions. So essentially I would say why these deep learning models work is that we, although we don't have a sheer large number, large sheer number of uh, how many samples we can get, but uh, within each sample, we actually can construct a lot of useful information to create the data points. That's that's what I want to comment now. <laughs> Excellent. So you know, actually, uh, Anshul Kandaji uh, asked a good question in the chat here. Uh, you know, about what you could say in general for stability or instability of deep learning models, if not, uh, in fact, all classes of ML models. Uh, maybe we'll start with Christina. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so we're, I mean, moving into this deep learning space because I think the, the, um, the, the models are very exciting and flexible and they're allowing us to do things that we couldn't do with the previous generation of machine learning models. But I, I think um, Anshul is exactly right that, um, it, it can be scary how unstable they are and you, you do have to use um, 
good machine learning practice, right? And you, you have to um, use ensembles. You, you, you have to be very careful um, not to fool yourself, as with all machine learning, that, that you're, you're um, really generalizing. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, I agree. It is, um, uh, there, you know, it is a, a something that we all have to be cautious about. Well, and just to push on it a little bit, Christina, um, you know, how does the stability change as you start to add even more, mo even more parameters or more complexity? You know, there's a certain kind of theoretical train of thought that's arising around uh, over parameterization actually being kind of useful uh, rather than detrimental. So as our models get more complex, will they get more stable or less? I, you know, I, I don't know that we can make a general statement, but yes, we've also seen these papers and also empirically the idea that you want to over parameterize and, and maybe it makes your gradients better, right? That you, and, and more ways to kind of approach a solution. It's, it's very interesting. I think the, you know, it's sort of a lesson for learning theory that the, the algorithm is part of, um, part, part of understanding whether, you, you know, the, the, whether you overfit. Excellent. Maybe we'll go on to a few other questions just to um, divide it up. Uh, you know, maybe Stephanie, you could say a little bit about what are the right inductive biases to use for genomics? And again, just because it's a general audience, maybe you can start by saying a little bit about what is meant by the term inductive bias. Sorry, I meant to say, say Sarah. If I meant to say Sarah, sorry about that. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it also maybe depends on the application a little bit. Um, I think it, there's, there's sort of, I guess, biases in the data itself. Um, and then there's also biases in terms of the methods that you choose, right? And that might be your own inductive bias um, about what you think will work better. Um, I, I think in population genetics, uh, this is, this kind of manifests itself as choosing models we think are realistic. Um, in terms of evolutionary models, say like clean splits between populations and, you know, it kind of we oversimplify in that case. And I think that that can lead to some inductive biases. Um, I think they would be a little bit different in, in each field. Um, but I think it's what I would like to see is actually methods that allow you to move between models. So often we fix the model and we fit it, right? In terms of say a um, two population model with a, a clean split and no admixture census split. Um, so what, what could we do to actually allow the method to explore models and so that we are not constraining ourselves in that way? Um, I think that would be, that would be super interesting and would, would kind of get us away and maybe explore solutions that we didn't think were really feasible, but actually happened over evolutionary history. So, so one discussion point that, that keeps coming up, I think it came up in Sarah's Q and A. Um, that I think is good to discuss as, as all of us is this role of simulated versus real data and, and in particular the role of simulated data and what all of us do, um, you know, who are up here on the virtual stage. On the one hand, simulated data can produce virtually an infinite number of training samples uh, and has lots of other benefits. On the other hand, if you're not careful, you've stopped learning about human biology at some point and you're learning about how this, this machine learning algorithm works, which of course is less interesting. So, so Sarah, why don't we uh, leave you on the stage uh, or you know, on the floor, so to speak, and, and maybe you can comment, uh, you know, just in general, how do you think about simulated data and when are the appropriate uses versus when are the inappropriate uses? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a great question because I think that in population genetics, we've relied on simulations, you know, really heavily, perhaps, you know, more than more than most fields. Um, and that's that's really because we can't really go back in a sense in the past and find this evolutionary ground truth. So if we wanted to infer historical mutation rates or recombination rates or population size changes, we we don't have the ground truth. So we are forced to rely on simulated data for anything that's sort of supervised, broadly defined. Um, 
However, I would say it's not as bad as it sounds because we do have actually very good evolutionary models. We know how to do the forward process. We just don't know how to infer, or that's the goal of population genetics, sort of to infer going back in time what actually happened. So I think that's, that it's it still, um, it still hampers us a bit because we only can simulate some things that we we think are real, but I think we do have very good evolutionary models. Um, I, I guess there's two exceptions to that. One is ancient DNA. So if we had really good ancient DNA, we could actually have some ground truth. However, it wouldn't be nearly enough to train any, okay, that's what I think right now, it wouldn't be nearly enough to train any machine learning model. And two is experimental evolution. So you can do this in yeast, or you could do this in you know some other type of um, fast reproducing species. Um, but I don't think you're going to be able to do experimental evolution for human, right? So um, I think that's that's where we will maybe always rely a little bit on simulations to test our model, to validate our model. Does it produce reasonable things in simulations? Maybe we can sort of triangulate with different models and say, okay, if the, all these models were tested in simulations with different caveats and things, and they all produce the same same result on real data, maybe we start to feel confident this is a real result. But without external validation techniques, we we won't exactly know what happened, you know, thousands of years in the past. Um, I think there's a power of GANs, you know, that's what I'm interested in right now, um, to, to help us make better simulated data, more realistic simulated data. I think we should think about like sort of underlying structure in the data, clustering and things, visualization that helps us um, learn more about uh, about the data in an unsupervised fashion. But I think we're always going to rely a little bit on simulations. John or Christina, did either one one of you want to comment? I mean, I think um, it's not clear how we do data augmentation in the genomic setting, right? With, whereas in the image setting, there's lots of strategies to augment your training uh, data. So, uh, you know, um, augmentation in a way that doesn't um, bias uh, badly. I, I will say the uh, simula uh, simulation data are useful to validate uh, hypotheses. So basically you want a develop method, you want the method to capture certain like inductive bias you believe to be true for this particular biological problem. Then you like to simulate the data so that the data have the property you wanted it to have and then check the model is useful or not to detect this kind of uh, thing. So, so essentially I think all of this as all these questions and the previous question are all related in a sense that uh, what, do we, what do, we, do we really want to do you, or to use this machine learning or deep learning approach for. Whether we just want them to improve prediction, that's okay. And uh, for example, we want to predict the protein structure. Sometimes we don't need to worry about how these structures are generated as long as it's useful, right? For drug discovery, et cetera. And for many other field, like uh, especially I know in the system biology and, and regulatory bio, uh, uh, genomics, people want to generate, find the tools that can, are able to identify certain knowledge, right? Certain kind of interactions. Uh, we don't know whether those are these, uh, kind, sometimes these interactions are very complex. So we, uh, we don't know whether the method is able to, to mine such a relationship. So we generate the data sets so that we can learn these kind of patterns. So this also comes back to their original question, why, what uh, is, uh, how do we actually use our deep learning in the right way for different problems? I would say for many problems in genomics, the accuracy is a secondary, right? We don't really want to push the accuracy to be very high. We want the model to be insightful. To we can use the model to discover a lot of a lot of new knowledge, a lot of new interact, new insights that would be better for us to, to for us to better understand the biology. So I think all of these are are related questions, and uh, it's it's all about how we actually design the right methodology to. To, to interrogate the data, to, uh, to, to identify what are the purpose are, whether we want to make the accurate prediction for some downstream analysis or our downstream applications, or we want to find a new biology or and better understand the biological system. And, and thanks for the segue to interpretation or explainability. So what, one thing I was gonna ask you, John, is, is both Sarah and Christina got questions about interpretability of, of their models. 
you didn't so much. So I was going to ask you, how do you think about interpretability or interpreting the models, say you're building for structural proteomics and protein folding? Yes. So we actually actually consider that uh, very much. So for example, when we build a model to predict a protein structure or protein contact uh, structure or interactions, we actually visualize. So there are a lot of approaches developed in the field to visualize activations of a certain layers in your neural network. So we can, we can, for example, you can essentially what you want to do is to take the gradient with respect to the input, right? And or you just across different type of data, you visualize which neurons are, are, are activated. In this way, we can actually go backwards to the original sequence or structure to identify whether there are some relationship between, for example, two beta strands or two alpha helical structure interacting with each other. So we also uh, do that, uh, check that uh, all the time. But instead, uh, I would say that our, the goal of uh, this problem we study is kind of different from other genomics uh, problems. We want to push the accuracy to be to, to a regime that we can use a prediction. And but for the uh, for the other field, I, like Trey, you have done a lot of work in this field. We all understand that. The, uh, we want to figure out what the model actually learns. Basically, essentially, I would say the, in the, at the end of the day, the, what do you actually learn that can be transferred, can be generalized are the very simple rules, right? Some biological rules. The rules are noisy rules. We can now easy to learn using very simple models. So that's why we need a deep learning. But finally, we need to distill this kind of knowledge from the model. One way is to using this interpretable approaches so like a postal analysis, right? After you build a model, you want to analyze what you have learned. Another way is like what you did and others did is you use this inductive bias, build the model in a way that the model already incorporated necessary uh, knowledge or biological information into the model so that you can visualize the model and, and, uh, and make conclusions and find a new New, new discoveries, right? So I think those are two different approaches people widely use in the field. I don't know which one is better. I think uh, both are, are have their own virtues. And, uh, but I think this will be the, uh, I think it will be a very important research area in the future. We, because in the end, we want to discover new biology, want to better understand the biological system. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And what I presented, you know, it's, it's very important to be able to predict gene expression because you want to learn the mapping from the epigenome or, or the genome genetics to expression. But actually, you know, expression is the easiest thing to measure of all the things that right. the model, right? That's right. So if you just wanted to predict, you, you could just measure it. Just measure it, exactly. <laughs> You know, I have a question for the panelists that's a little bit more related to kind of training. Uh, one of the things you all three have highlighted is the challenges of actually getting your models trained. And there's a fair amount of kind of knob turning that has to happen. And that's the kind of thing that really um, is the domain of experts who really learned in an environment how to do it. But, you know, now imagine your lab, you're a lab that hasn't yet done a lot of work in machine learning and you want to start being able to build your own models and being able to apply them to the kind of question of interest. What's the best way to, to get up to speed? Is it by finding a collaborator, recruiting a postdoc that knows how to do it, uh, or just blood, sweat, and tears? Um, maybe, Christina, you can start. I'm, I'm a big believer in um, bringing in postdocs who are well-trained in the area and get them, you know, getting them excited about biology, right? And, and having a tra training environment where you can say, look, you know, you, you have exciting methods, but we have the, we have the real problems, right? Yeah. And um, we can put this methodology to use in a really impactful and meaningful and biologically um, uh, sensible way. So yeah, so you have to you have to lure them away from Google and Facebook and get them in your lap. So you mean there are some people who'd rather work on cancer than selling ads? Yeah, this is all our, you all all we have is um, you know come cure cancer. <laughs> we can't offer the salaries, or, you know, but we can. Um, you, there is a mission. You know, I, I see we're almost at time, so maybe actually we'll just end on that note. 
Uh, I thought this was uh, just a wonderful session. I'd really like to spank, thank all of the speakers. Um, and there were many questions we actually really, great questions that we didn't get to today, but I thought this was a great discussion. Thanks everybody, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.